How's everybody doing this morning? If you have your Bibles with you, I want you to turn to one passage of Scripture. I'm going to unpack it a little bit, and then I'll read some other Scriptures, but um, it's going to be Luke chapter 2, verse 52. Luke chapter 2, verse 52. Every single uh, Sunday before we do a worship rehearsal, um, there's a devotion time, and this last week, Cindy was sharing this verse, and as she shared it, I just got a, just a download in a moment, um, the message for today, and I think it's appropriate because we're celebrating seniors taking their next step of where they're going, and the title of today's message is Steps of Maturity That Jesus Went Through, the Steps of Maturity That Jesus Went Through, and these are Steps of Maturity. If Jesus went through something, it's actually an invitation for us to go through it as well. Is that, is that a fair statement? And so, let me read this verse, and I'm going to read out Young's literal translation. It's not something I typically use, but it came up when I was looking at it last week, and and I like it. It says this, and Jesus was advancing, let me hear you say advancing. Jesus was advancing in wisdom and in stature and in favor with both God and men. Jesus was advancing in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and with men. And I believe that if Jesus was advancing in a particular area, it's probably a pretty good idea for us to study the area that even Jesus had to advance in. Is that a fair statement? And so if we're going to understand the steps of maturity, when this is said about Jesus, remember the the Messiah could have come and just shown up as a fully grown adult, spent an hour or less on the planet if his whole purpose was only to go to the cross and die and pay for our salvation. If that was the only purpose that Jesus served, he could have done that like this. There was no qualification that said that he had to live for 33 years, that he had to be born as a baby, that he had to go through all the the growth steps and maturity steps, other than his father had prophesied it all throughout the Old Testament. That was the only reason Jesus went through this time frame. He could have just shown up. And so there's a greater purpose that Jesus showed up on. The the gospel that Jesus came to preach was not the gospel of salvation. It was the gospel of the kingdom. Let me say the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom is that there's a higher rule, there's a higher reign, there's a higher authority by which we're called to live by. And the the message that that he preached, the message that he demonstrated on an ongoing basis was that there's the kingdom of heaven and as it advances, it transforms and changes things. The gospel of salvation is what gets you into the kingdom of heaven. Whenever you accept Jesus Christ, it's the door that you enter into it. And and anytime I teach this, I always say, if you look at the door, Jesus says, I'm the door. The point of the door is not the door itself. The point of the door is to enter into the next thing. Is that correct? And so when we're understanding what's happening, when you hear advancement, there's a progression that's taking place. You're entering into a greater or higher level of understanding than you previously held. It's a greater advancement. It's moving on. Notice it doesn't say retreat. There is no retreat in the kingdom. The, retreat, the kingdom is not retreating back. And if you're, if you're not careful, because of the time that we live in where there's lots of natural disasters and certainly have been praying for the folks that were impacted by the tornadoes up in the Midwest and Missouri and, and all the way up into Ohio and some of those places, people that have been impacted by the floods that are going on. Like, certainly there's some darkness, there's some need that's out there where people are going through some suffering points. But if we allow suffering to inform our theology about what God wants to do, it might cause us to think that God's kingdom is retreating instead of advancing, and His kingdom is never retreating. Let me hear you say, the kingdom is never retreating. It's always advancing. So even when you read in spiritual warfare in Ephesians chapter 6, it says this. He says, when you've done all you can to stand, stand. So sometimes we think we've got this opposition, the spiritual warfare going. We feel like, well, I mean, push back. No, it says stand. Stand your ground. Stand firm. So even when you've got something against you, you stand your ground so you could advance after the attack. And so what we want to need to look at is how did Jesus advance in these three particular areas, and that's just going to give us an idea of what maturity looks like after your initial salvation. If you're born again, say, I am. 
Okay, so you know that, that Jesus died for you. You've, you've, uh, not, it's not just about praying a prayer, but you know there's this transaction where the old person that was you has been die, is killed with Christ on the cross, and now you've transitioned into this brand new creation. After that, there needs to be steps of maturity. There needs to be an advancement and a growth. And these three particular areas are great marker points for us. The area of wisdom. Let me hear you say wisdom. And I'm going to unpack these in a second, but wisdom is thinking like God. It might be the practical application of knowledge, but that's a real heady term. It's thinking like God. It's acting like God. It's wisdom. God always moves in wisdom. He always moves in wisdom. How do I know this? Scripture says this. It was by wisdom that he laid the foundations of the earth, that he set the the boundary markers of the oceans, that he created the stars. It was by wisdom. Let me say by wisdom. So it was by wisdom that God advanced creation. It's thinking like God thinks. It's creating in this perspective where God is always creating. He's always advancing moving forward. We know science proves that the universe is expanding at a rapid rate. It's continuing to advance. Why? Because the Word of God went out and it says it never returns back to Him void. So through the echo of eternity, God's Word went and said, let there be light, 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 advancing. Right? I mean, there's this creative moment that did not cease. It's continuing to advance. So if you feel like you've been in a season where it's been a season of retreat or you've been underneath a season of attack and you're like, man, I, I just don't know what's going on. Maybe you're, you're doubting your purpose. You're doubting some of the steps that you're going through because you just don't understand what's going on. What I want to tell you is grow in wisdom. Think like God and realize in that moment, wait a minute, no, the thing I'm going through right now is for my advancement. It's not for my retreat. Okay? Now, John the Baptist says... Whenever uh, John is baptizing, he's got disciples, and uh, Jesus begins to to begins to baptize people. And his John the Baptist's disciples come and say, "Hey, we feel like we have a conflicting message going on here." Jesus is now baptizing people over here, and people are leaving us, and they're going over to Jesus. And and John goes, "Well, this is the one that I came to declare and, and to prepare a way for." And he said, "So I must what decrease so he can increase." Decrease and increase has nothing to do with advancement. You have to understand when I decrease in my will, my desires, my understanding, I'm actually increasing him in me. I'm actually advancing the kingdom in and through my life when I decrease so that he can increase its advancement. That's why the Bible says that if a person wants to save their life, they'll actually lose it. But if they lose their life for my sake, they actually gain it. So even when it feels like I'm retreating, even when it feels like I'm decreasing, that actually means this place for me to be able to advance. That's why it says, in my weakness, God is what? So I'm really always advancing, aren't I? I'm never at a loss. I'm never in lack. I'm never at this place where I am missing something, even when it feels like it, even when it looks like it, even when it sounds like it. Can I get an amen on that? Has anybody ever been through circumstances recently or in the past where it felt like, it sounded like, and it looked like you were getting pushed backwards and and you were actually losing ground? Is that just me? Okay. And so we have to understand, and even in that place, in my weakness, his strength advances and he will not be denied. And so Jesus grew in wisdom. We'll talk about that more in a second. Jesus, number two, grew in stature. Let me hear you say stature. There's two aspects of stature. There is both identity, and then there's also this aspect of height, right? There's this, there's, I, I have a physical stature. There's a presence. And so Jesus, as he was maturing from a young baby to a young child to an older child to a teenager and into adulthood, he continued to grow in stature both physically, mentally, emotionally, but also in the spirit. He continued to grow in this place of what stature looks like, and I'm going to unpack that in a second. And the final part of that verse was, is Jesus grew in favor. Let me hear you say favor. Favor is the anointing from God. Favor is the anointing from God. Some people say, well, uh, it's, it's just, you know, grace is unmerited favor. That's partially true. It's partially true. 
But we have to understand this is that God picked you to give his grace to and he determined that you merited it. Do you hear what I'm saying? Like, like it's like here's what happens sometimes. We say, well, I don't deserve favor. I'm, I take on this position of false humility. Somebody is saying kind things or nice things about me. I'm, I'm finding I have open doors, and I feel like because I have to be humble that I just need to downplay it and kind of push it back because, no, it's, it's really God's grace, and it's unmerited favor. If you take credit for it, then you've moved into pride. However, when you do this false humility stuff, you're actually not giving him credit for it, and it's pride. It actually produces the same result in you. It's orphanhood. It's poverty. It's pushing you back, and you actually retreat away from the favor that is necessary to advance you into what God has for you. So Jesus continued to grow in this favor through the course of his life, both with his father, which is amazing to me. Like, I I think about this. God loves me as much as he's ever going to love me, but I can grow an increase of his love for me. You know what that looks like? I'm more aware of it. His love, his favor for me is is as big as it's ever going to get because God is infinite. It really has to do with my understanding. Part of maturity is fully grasping and understanding what God is saying about you, what he thinks about you, what he's making available to you. And really, when you grow in favor, you're actually growing in a greater understanding of, wait a minute, God chose me. I didn't deserve it in the first place, but when he picked me, he said I merited it. Because God doesn't give something away without expecting a return. He expects when he sows favor into you that there's going to be a great harvest that's going to come out of it. He gives it to you so that you can grow. And so let's look at these things. Number one, wisdom, thinking like God. James chapter 1, verse 5, and the Passion Translation says this. And there's so many verses that I could read. The whole book of, uh, of Proverbs really deals with wisdom. Solomon, the wisest man. But James chapter 1, verse 5 says this. If anyone longs to be wise, ask God for wisdom, and he will give it. He won't see your lack of wisdom as an opportunity to scold you over your failures, but he will overwhelm your failures with his generous grace. Isn't that beautiful? Let me read that again. If anyone longs to be wise, ask God for wisdom and he will give it. He won't see your lack of wisdom as an opportunity to scold you over your failures, but he will overwhelm your failures. Let me hear you say overwhelm. Does that sound like advancement? He's going to advance his blessings, his favor over your life. He will overwhelm your failures with his generous grace. Look what it says in verse 6. Just make sure you ask empowered by confident faith. Just make sure you ask empowered by confident faith without doubting that you will receive. For the ambivalent person believes one minute and doubts the next. Verse 7 and 8. Being undecided makes you become like the rough seas driven and tossed by the wind. You're up one minute, tossed down the next. When you're half-hearted and wavering, it leaves you unstable. Can you really expect to receive anything from the Lord when you're in that condition? Why? Because in that condition, even if he gave it to me, I'm going to fumble it. Like we've got football camps going on right now. It's the spring uh, NFL, OTAs, and all that stuff. And right now, they don't have pads. They don't have anything like that. But what they're looking for is these rookies and these undrafted guys that come in, and they're handing them the football, and they're going to see if they're going to secure it, and they're going to run with it. But when you lack confidence, right, when you lack boldness with it, the first time you get touched, the ball's going to go on the ground, and it's going to fumble and go around. What happens after a few times? They stop handing you the football. And actually, what the lot of coaches, guys, y- y'all know this. If you put a football, actually, I, we did this with basketball. I played basketball. And, and what coach would have us do is we'd carry the basketball around, and he'd be walking down the hallway, and he'd boom, and he'd try to hit the basketball out of your hand. You know, he did, they, the football coaches did that. So they're carrying that thing around, and then they told the other, other people, hey, on the team, if you see so-and-so walking by, go in and smack the snot out of that football. See if you can knock it out. Why? Because until we can trust him with more, we have to see how he carries what he has. You have to learn how to walk in confidence so that when they stepped onto the practice field, 
They were willing to give you the ball and see if you could test it. And then what happens when game time comes down? We're willing to trust you to give you the ball so you can advance. What's the point of football? It's to advance down the field. It's never to go backwards. First and 25 is not a good place to be. Fourth and 25 is not a good place to be. Right? I don't care if you're Tom Brady. It's not a good place to be. The point of it is advancing over the goal line. And so God wants you to grow in wisdom where you think like him. So where do you fumble the ball a lot of times in your thoughts? In your confidence level up here, is God really who he says he is? Can he really do what he says he's going to do? Does he really love me? Am I capable in him to do these things? You just, it's his battlefield of the mind. You're not the least. You're the head. You're not the tail. Right? You're above. You're not beneath. That's the kingdom. And so when you begin to take thought every single captive and now you come to him and you begin to ask for wisdom because you're understanding, I need wisdom to think like he does, what it says is if you're going to ask for the football, if you're going to ask for wisdom, be ready with confidence to grab a hold of it and run with it. The worst thing can happen in a backfield is the quarterback turns around and he gives it to the running back and the running back's like, because what's going to happen? It ain't going to be pretty. Snot's going to go out this way. Grass is going to be this way. The foot, the helmet's going to be off, right? <laughs> hey, can you tell we're in summer, guys? It's all right. I'm, getting, I'm excited for men's advance next week, <laughs> right? So what God wants to do is he wants to get you prepared. So when you're asking, be confident. Let me say be confident. It's not enough to say, God, please, 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 please. That's not confidence. That is not a bold prayer. God's going to go, I already gave you something. All right, what are you doing with what I'm giving you? If I gave you more, you'd fumble it. It would actually hurt you. Think about this, for example. The example I just gave you about putting the running back in the game who's ill-prepared for it, right? And it's the Super Bowl, and you've got these big 6'6", 6'7", 300-pound guys that can run a 4'4", lots of muscle, and you hand the football over to them, it would be unkind for the coach to put the guy in the position to not just fumble the ball, but to get his head knocked off. That would be unkind. It would not be wise. So a wise coach prepares his players to be on the field. A wise God is going to prepare you, grow in maturity, grow in stature, it means that he's not going to put you in positions that you can, where you can't handle it. It might require more faith and more boldness, but you have to be able to need wisdom and you need to think after him boldly in what he has for you. Number two, stature. Let me hear you say stature again. So let me give you the definition of stature. Stature is the quality or the status gained by growth, development, or achievement. Stature, quality or status gained by growth, development, or achievement. Sounds like advancement to me. And so in order for you to grow in stature, you actually have to grow and develop and take risks. You have to step out there. There's a moment where you do have to get on the field. You do have to take a risk stepping out. I like where it says status. I got the definition of status for you. Status status is a position or rank in relation to others. For example, the status of a father. So it's the rank of a father. The status of a father means I'm in a position to be able to steward or to parent my kids or to give direction, to give guidance. There's this place of growing into stature, growing into status of an identity. It's relative rank in a hierarchy of prestige, especially high prestige. So what I'm here to tell you is your identity in Christ, again, you're the head, you're not the tail, you're above, you're not beneath. You're a child of God. Let me hear you say, I'm a child of God. I'm a saint of God. Let me hear you say, I'm a saint of God. A saint doesn't mean that you've just been forgiven and you should get into heaven. It's actually a part of your identity where you walk in purity and you walk in wholeness because Jesus has wiped your stain of your sin. He's given you a brand new identity, and there's a stature inside of you according to sainthood. It's not just Mother Teresa. Every one of us are called to be a saint. Now, the question is, is how do I grow into that identity of a saint? There's lots of other identities and things that we could talk through, but when you're talking about sainthood and you're talking about child, what it means is I have access to the things that the Father has. And so if I'm going to grow in this position, this hierarchy, this rank, I have to understand that my identity is directly connected into what my purpose is going to look like. 
I know who I am in Christ, and therefore what flows out of my life is going to be purpose. Jesus came on the planet knowing exactly who he was. He was not ambivalent on who he was. He knew exactly who God created or who had sent him into the, the mother's womb to be able to be. Like there was a purpose by which Christ was sent on the planet. And, and as much as he's going about and he's healing the sick and he's doing these things, he knew his greater purpose was to be able to be able to wipe out the penalty of sin forever and establish his Father's kingdom in a different way. And so you can look through different scriptures where it talks about some of these things. Let me go to back to the Old Testament, Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Why are we fighting for life so much right now? Like there's a silly thing with these different laws that are being passed about the heartbeat bill. And, and it blows my mind that there would be, somebody would think there would be a rational reason to stop a heartbeat. Okay, so here on this, before I knit you in your mother's womb, I had ordained your steps. Why? Because in every single baby, Every single created being, there is purpose ordained by the Father in heaven. Now, let me share this with you real quick because I think this might help bring some clarity on this. Just because a life is shortened here on the earth does not mean that the Father's intended purpose never gets carried out or fulfilled for that purpose. It just means they're elevated to a next step where God's will for that person will be carried out to a greater extent. I remember when Papa Jack was talking about several years ago, and there was some, there were several men, uh, just incredible heroes, generals in the faith, you know, Miles Monroe, uh, Bob Phillips, uh, there was another individual that had passed away, and Papa Jack went to the Lord and was kind of arguing with him, because these men were at the height, or the prime of their influence and impact in the kingdom on the planet, and he says, Father, I don't fully understand this, because I, I believe the enemy still kills and destroys, why did you allow this? And then here's what the Father's response was. Do you think I allowed them to be taken to a place of lesser influence than they held on the planet? He says, that's a, that's, that's a good point. He says, I am utilizing them in a way that you can't possibly imagine here in heaven. Uh, I talked to somebody uh, a couple weeks ago, and they said when they, when they actually had a heaven experience and, and they were talking to somebody and they saw this great big building, and he asked the angel, says, what is that? And he says, that's the intercessory hall. And he says, and right now, Miles Monroe is leading intercession in the, in the hall. It, we, we don't fully understand it, okay? That doesn't mean that right now, just because there's suffering on the planet, we better to end the suffering through death. It's not. Suffering is always better when you advance through it in his life and you trust him on the end of your days, Okay? And so there's this ability that we have to be able to speak life and death into a circumstance, and it has to be consistent with our identity and our calling in God. Jeremiah had a calling before God put him in his mother's womb. He had, he had ordained him as a prophet to the nations. Look what it says in Psalm 139. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous, how well I know it. You watched me as I was formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born, and every day, listen to what it says, every day, let me hear you say every day, of my life, every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. So if you want to understand your stature, to grow in stature, you have to understand your identity, your relational connection to the Father as a child. And then from that place, then you begin to connect them. So Father, as your son, as your daughter, what is my purpose? Jeremiah had a purpose. John the Baptist had a purpose. Jesus had a purpose. What's my purpose? And you begin to connect into that because your purpose is not going to be the same as everybody else. You have a very unique purpose, but it's got to flow out of your relational connectivity as him, as your father, you as a son or a daughter. Then you connect into your unique purpose. So what? You can grow into your purpose. You can grow in stature. Isaiah 49.5, now the Lord speaks, the one who formed me in my mother's womb to be his servant, who commissioned me to bring Israel back to him. The Lord has honored me, and my God has given me strength. So Isaiah was commissioned. He was ordained to bring Israel back to him. The Lord honored him and gave him strength. So what is your calling? 
What has God ordained you to be? What has he commissioned your life to be? And if you understand, if he gave Isaiah honor and he gave Isaiah strength, he'll give you strength and he'll give you honor and he'll give you stature and he'll grow you in that anointing that comes from heaven for you to grow into who God has created and redeemed you to be. Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's masterpiece. He's created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. I say this quite often. Your doing always has to flow out of your being. You're a human being. You're not a human doing. Whenever you begin doing things, you get your identity from doing. It's performance-based, and you will always end up disappointed because you're always going to measure who you are by how much you've accomplished, and that's a dangerous place to be. Because you can never rest in that. Because there's always one more thing to do and one more thing to do and one more thing to do. Because all right, I'm called to advance. I was created to advance. But when I understand I get my identity from being His, and what flows out of that is my doing, that means I don't have to strive in my doing. I've already received honor. That means no matter what I do, I'm still loved by Him. Now, it frees me up to actually go out and become who he called me to be. John 13, 3. Here's the one I was getting to. Jesus knew. Let me hear you say Jesus knew. So if Jesus knew something, is it a good idea for us to know it? Yes, no? I kind of heard that very, very well. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and returned to God. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and that he would return to God. And so Jesus says this later on, the things you see me do, do also. In fact, you'll do greater things because I go to be what? With the Father. So this verse applies to you. You have to know you've come from the Father. You have to know where you originate from. That's where your identity comes from. That's where your anointing comes from. That's where your authority comes from. There's this interesting story of the sons of Sceva who were Jewish exorcists. They were not messianic. They did not know Jesus, but they were exorcists. So prior to Jesus, they liked to dabble and try to chase out demons. And there's a story where the seven sons of Sceva go and they see this demonic man, and they said, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, come out of that man. And the demon, the guy steps back and goes, I know Paul and I know Jesus. Who the heck are you? And he turns around and he kicks all of them. I mean, he just beats them up. So much so that they're, they run through the streets naked. They were defeated. Why? Because they were just using something that they didn't have the stature of the authority for. Until you know where you originate from, the identity in Christ, and you're born again, your authority will never come. But you pull from the stature of heaven. You grow in authority. You grow in that stature by knowing who you are. And then you can cast out demons by your belief. Number three, favor. So we talked about this anointing from God that leads to open doors to bring kingdom in accordance to God's call and design for your life. So Luke chapter 4, verse 1, then Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit. Let me hear you say, Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit. That's an important scripture, don't you think? If we're going to call ourselves Christians, if you're born again, say, I am. So if you're going to call yourself a Christian, a born-again Christian, it would be important to identify with the one that you call yourself afterwards. So anything Jesus had access to, anything Jesus stepped through and walked through is important for you to be able to access and walk in. And Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit. And so he returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Luke chapter 4, verse 18, later on, he reads the Messiah's mandate. I love what this says. Remember, we're talking about our doing. This is flowing into favor to open doors. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. The Holy Spirit anointed. He, he came upon Jesus and favored Him with the strength and the capacity and the authority to be able to fulfill what God had called him to do. So I hear this all the time. If you're new to Legacy, um, or if you've been around Legacy for a while, you've heard me say this before, but for those that are, that are new, we have to understand that Jesus wasn't doing anything he did on the planet as God. 
He was fully, 100% God, but he laid down the privilege of God and took on the 100% man capacity. Why? Because if Jesus did every miracle, every blind eye opened, he raised the dead, he cast out the demons because he was God, none of us would stand a chance. We would be able to have the legitimate excuse of, well, of course, he's Jesus. You know, I'm not perfect. I'm not Jesus. But that's not what happened. What happened was is he was fully man, fully God. He had to obey his Father, and he had to be empowered by the Holy Spirit, which means he had the capacity to sin. Does that throw anybody? He had free choice. But he was sinless because he always walked in perfect relationship with his father. Do you hear what I'm saying? I didn't say Jesus was sinful. He was sinless, but he had the capacity to do wrong because he was tempted in every way we are tempted, yet he was without sin. Why was he without sin? Because he chose not to. He chose to stay in right relationship. Why? So he can model for you and me what it looks like in this planet, that you're going to have trials, you're going to have temptations, there's stuff that's going to be thrown into your way, and there's going to be the temptation in that moment to lose your Christian identity and to be able to step back into the old dead person's identity and go blah, 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 blah. I'll say, well, I'm just human. I ain't Jesus. I ain't perfect. That's no excuse. It's no excuse. If you're born again, you have the fullest capacity. That's why you have to be led by the Holy Spirit. That's why you have to surrender your life. You have to decrease so God can increase inside of you so that he is what's going through your life, not the old man. He wants to advance his life inside of you. He wants to advance his healing inside of you. He wants to advance his maturity and his favor through you. But you're going to have to get to the place where you understand I have to be able to be a conduit of his favor that he's going to do something through my life. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be my witnesses to me in Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Acts chapter 2, verse 1, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Let me me say this. I've, I've heard some different teachings, and I'm just going to give you my thought on this real quick. I've heard people say, Well, unless there's two or more gathered in his name, he can't come. That's not true. I don't care if you're the only one in your office. I don't care if you're the only one in your school. I don't care if you're the only one in government. I don't care if you're the only one in Hollywood. If you and him together, there's more than one. Two or more means you and him equals majority. Okay? Okay? So I know they were all in one accord, and we have to say, well, we have to wait for us all to be in one accord for the Holy Spirit to follow. No, we don't. They just happen to be in one accord, and there's a greater manifestation, I think, that happens when there's more people gathered in one place in one accord. There's a greater manifestation that will be released. But don't use that as an excuse and say, well, I have to wait till more Christians get to my job. I have to wait to get more Christians into Hollywood. I have to get more Christians in the government. Then we'll be able to bring the kingdom. No, how about you plus God equals majority? Let's go. How about they'll come because you're there? How about they'll come because they'll grow in stature as they see you grow in stature, as you grow in favor, and you step into fully who God created and redeemed you to be. That's the purpose, and that's where we're going. That's what I'm going to tell you students. As you go to university, you're going to see crazy stuff. I don't care if it's a conservative university. There's the university I went to, Texas A&M, uh, the first couple years of college, well, it used to be a very conservative university, and there's all kinds of craziness that's happened in there that's not where I was there 20-something years ago. There, there's, I, I finished at Wayland Baptist. I was talking to somebody. I love Wayland Baptist. They really helped me to finish my degree. But even in there, there's some schools of thought because you have people that are coming in. So no matter where you go, you're going to face the yeast. Let me say the yeast. You're going to face the yeast of the Sadducees and the Pharisees in Herod. Political spirits, religious spirits. You're going to face, you know, in political agendas and all kinds of stuff. They're going to be everywhere. What's yeast? Yeast comes into a dough so it can rise. It takes a little bit. So no matter where you go, you're going to see it. But you're called to be the yeast of the kingdom. The yeast of the kingdom is greater than anything that's out there. How about you go into that place and you transform the whole dough? How about you be holy for he is holy right where he's placed you? So it says when the day of Pentecost, okay. Can we all agree that the early church, there's about 150 150, 180 that are gathered in this place in this time, believers. 
in Christ. And they're in the upper room. Can we agree that the political climate of Jerusalem at the time was not a good place to be a Christian? Can we all agree that the religious climate of Jerusalem at the time was not a good place to be a Christian? They had just killed your leader. Okay, can we all agree that? Look what happens in the middle of that. They did not shy away. They did not shy away. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were in one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. They were all filled, a tongue of fire in each person. Why? Here's the favor of God for you and for you and for you and for you. If the tongue of fire came and appeared on Peter, but not the other 150, there would have been this mindset going, well, Peter's the chosen one. He's got to do it all. But that's not what it was about. It came upon them all, and they turned around and began to equip the saints for the work of ministry. That's the purpose. It's not my responsibility to fulfill your calling. It's your responsibility to fulfill your calling. It's not my responsibility to steward your heart. It's your responsibility to steward your heart by doing this, humbling yourself before the Lord, growing in who he's called you to be, growing in wisdom, growing in stature, growing in favor in the Lord. You've got to take responsibility for that. You can't place it on the church. And I just feel like the Lord wants me to say this right now. If you came from a background with some church hurt because there was a leader that, that, uh, that either did you wrong or disappointed you, It's time to forgive them and move on and stop basing your church experience based off the past. Has anybody ever eaten in a bad restaurant? Did you stop eating after that? Did you stop going to restaurants? No, of course you didn't. All of you are looking very healthy. (laughs) So just because something bad happened, how about you go into your next experience with the Lord and say, Lord, where are you calling me? Where are you calling me to bring my wisdom? and my stature, and my favor to help that place grow in wisdom and stature and nature so it can fulfill the kingdom calling. Because it's not all about you. Jesus came not to fulfill his own desire, but to fulfill the desire of the one who sent him. Philippians 4.13 says, For I can do everything through Christ who what? Gives me strength. Why don't you stand up with me? Bow your heads, close your eyes. I'm going to give you an invitation right now. Nobody's looking but me, but if you came into this place this morning and you would say, Pastor, I've never been born again. Everything you just talked about sounds really good, but I don't know where I came from and I certainly don't know where I'm going after this. Jesus says he knew he came from the Father. He's fulfilling the Father's will and he was going back to the Father. The only way that you can know that is by becoming born again. And I give you an invitation right now. If you want to be born again, just raise your hand. Say, that's me. I want to know where I came from so I can know where I'm supposed to do. I see you, brother. I see you, sister. So I can know where I'm going back to. So together, we've got just a couple raising their hand. Pray with me together as a family. Lord Jesus, I recognize that you came from the Father of heaven. That you came to the earth to die for my penalty of sin. That you resurrected from the dead three days later by the power of the Holy Spirit so that I might be resurrected from the dead. So in this moment, I give over my life to you. I cede all control over to you. You are my Lord. You are my Savior. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Create me to be a brand new being, a masterpiece of yours, so I can do the things you created me to do. Keep your heads bowed and eyes closed. If you prayed that prayer, you are now born again. 
It means the moment that you die, you pass into heaven for all of eternity. And that's a beautiful thing. But even more right now on this planet, you have the capacity to begin to grow in wisdom. You have the capacity now to be able to grow in stature. And you have the capacity now to be able to grow in favor with the Lord. And the Lord's going to fill you up right now. So, Father, I just bless my brother right now. I just bless my sister. I say, come, Holy Spirit, fill them fresh with you, Lord God. Fill them fresh with you. So overwhelm them with your goodness, Lord God, that they will know who they are in you, God. That whatever challenges they face coming in are going to pale in comparison to the greatness of who you are. That you're going to give them the ability and the strength to walk all the days of their life in you. Lord, right now, I just pray for every person in this room that you would just take us all to a greater place of wisdom. None of us have arrived, Father. So we ask you right now, the, the wisdom you've given me, I thank you for it, but I want more wisdom. So I ask you now with boldness and confidence, Father, give us more wisdom. Lord God, we know that you grew in stature, Lord. I pray right now that you would grow us, Lord, that we would advance in our identity in you, that we would advance in our wholeness in you, Lord God, that we would advance in our purpose in you, God. And Lord, I just thank you that your anointing, your favor is falling upon every single person now in the name of Jesus. Lord God, that every person is marked highly favored by you. And there's no plan of the enemy. There's not height nor depth. Nothing can separate us from your love, which also means nothing can separate us from your favor. So we choose as an act of faith, an act of our will today to walk in advancement. Say, I will advance in the kingdom now. I will advance in my identity. And I will advance his kingdom everywhere I go. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray and all God's people said. Somebody give him a shout of praise.